to this next presentation. Greg Zwicky with NRCS um, and the Air Quality Division of NRCS is going to talk about one of their air quality assessment tools. And when well, we were talking about the crust being beneficial from an H2S perspective, maybe not for other gases. And so I think um, it kind of ties into this tool that you're going to present and, and some of its role. So please help me welcome Greg. Thank you. And, and thanks again to Jose and, and Eileen for bringing this up. I, you know, th this talk's not going to focus that much on hydrogen sulfide, but I do have some experience in my previous life with hydrogen sulfide. We did a lot of work at pulp and paper mills, and, and of course they use a lot of sulfur in some of their systems. And uh, their lagoons are typically are, are aerobic or, or aerated at least, and so you tend to not get as much H2S production. But I know we did some monitoring at a couple of the sites and. We were downwind one time, had one of the samplers out there trying to figure out what the concentrations were coming off, and I noticed it was getting above 20, I think we were around 27, and the young technician we had with us was like, I don't smell anything. And, and one of the things about hydrogen sulfide is it's one of those one of those chemicals that blinds you pretty quickly. You get a, above a certain concentration, you don't smell it anymore, so you don't worry about it. So if you don't have one of these monitors that Eileen was, was showing, um, it doesn't take long and, and you're laying on the ground. And so when he mentioned that, we got him the heck out of there. He had a really bad headache for a while after that, um, but, but you get out of there. The uh, other experience I've had with hydrogen sulfide is, is rooming with my cousin Bubba in college. <laughs> That's a story for a different day, so we're not gonna go into that, um, but uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna shift our focus a little bit. So Aaron mentioned that this National Air Quality Site Assessment Tool was an NRCS tool. It's not really an NRCS tool. Um, we helped pay for it, but it was really developed by the land grant university systems. We had a, a couple of projects uh, through the Conservation Innovation Grant Program through NRCS, and uh, and they built it for us. So so we've got a lot of partners, a lot of a lot of folks actually out in the room who were either original developers or have now joined the team and, and are helping out. So I appreciate uh, the support here in the presentation. So what I want to kind of cover here in just the next couple minutes is, is really, you know, what is NAXAT? We'll do that pretty briefly. I know there's been a lot of information out there, a lot of presentations, a lot of webinars, things like that that you can access, but we'll, we'll cover that briefly. Um, take a look at some recent NRCS or some uh, overall NAXAT training efforts that have gone on, and then take a look at how we as NRCS are trying to get something out of our conservation innovation grants. You know, a lot of times we have these grants and, and we either learn something or we don't, and then we just don't ever use it again, and there's not, not necessarily an application. This is one of those projects that was really good because we got something out of it. We got a tool that we can use, and so now as we start to implement the tool and start using it in our agency, um, we, we've learned some things and we've, we've identified some needs and, and, uh, and hopefully can, can help develop it and, and, and make it better for the future and, and use it a little bit better in the future as well. So again, NACSAT is the National Air Quality Site Assessment Tool. I've got the URL link there. Um, it's housed at Texas a and University. Texas a and was one of the original developers or helped in the development of it. The only reason it's housed there is because that's where the programmer was. So there's nothing, nothing more than that. Um, it, again, it's used for livestock and poultry operations. It, it, the, the developers actually put it together for seven different species now after, after putting it uh, together. So you've got dairy, swine, beef, um, three different poultries, layer, uh, broilers, and turkeys, and then they added horses in the last iteration as well. So we've got seven species that are covered. Um, really, you're looking at confinement-based livestock, so, so if you've got pastured cattle, things like that, you're not really going to use an axe hat necessarily. Um, again, it was developed under two NRCS conservation innovation grants. The first one was led by Michigan State University. The second one was led by Colorado State University, but there were a whole bunch of universities that, that contributed into the development. And uh, what, what NACSAT really does is it, it, it doesn't ask you about air quality on the farm. They, we, we quickly realized as we were starting development, developing it, not that many people, will, if you ask them an air quality question, they're, they're, gonna, they're not going to know the answer, right? So, so we started asking questions about what do you have on your farm? How are you managing your farm? Um, it's kind of like a 20 questions based system where it asks you a question in one area and then based on your answer to that question, it pops up another question or two and you answer those and it kind of, it's a whole nested set of questions that kind of lead to a score at the very end and it's, it's a non-quantitative score. So when you answer all these questions, you're looking at, at really eight different categories of your operation and it asks individual questions for each of those eight categories. They don't cross lines necessarily, so in some cases there are some repetitive questions, like under the perception area, it asks about your roads and whether or not you have wind breaks and that sort of stuff on there too. But these, these uh, score bars aren't linked to each other, and you can see there are seven different emissions that, uh, that NAXAT analyzes. 
In this, uh, in this score bar, green is good, white not so much. So the more green you have, the better you're doing relative to what you could be doing on your farm. Um, the white bars, or mostly white bars, indicate some areas for improvement. So those are the ones that you really want to start to take a look, a, a little bit closer look at to see where you might make some changes and improve your, uh, your error emissions. Um, just in the development of NACS that I mentioned, we had a whole bunch of university partners, and that's actually the next slide, but here are the, the partners that actually provided funding to develop the tool in addition to the, the NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant. Um, you can see there are some universities that put in matching funds, but we also have a lot of producer groups, and a lot of producers were involved in the, the development and testing of the tool as well, so we've got kind of that background. You know, we didn't want it just to be a bunch of university people coming up with theory and not actually putting it into practice. This is this was actually tested on farm and used in producer settings and producers came back and said, this question's stupid, don't put it in there. So they changed it and you know kind of kind of a lot of back and forth there to, to hopefully make it a little bit better for use actually on the farm. A producer can go out, answer these questions and, and come back with a score for NRCS as we're doing our conservation planning. That was the whole goal uh, to begin with. So on our university partners, we're up to about 20 now. And they're from sea to shining sea, right? So um, the, the folks who were underlined, bolded, and italicized um, were, were the original universities that participated in the, the 2007 grant, the initial grant. And then as the, as the other grant uh, back in 2011, I believe it was, um, came about, we added some more. And then after the project was done, we realized that, hey, you know what, we're going to have some maintenance needs. And we're going to have to spread the word as NRCS starts adopting the, the, the tool. Uh, we need to get other states involved as well. So we've got a lot of states that have, have kind of jumped in and, and provided people that, um, that have provided input and, and help with NRCS uh, to, to help implement the, the tool. Moving on to the training efforts, um, you know, obviously this is, this is a Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center sponsored event, right? And they've been very helpful in getting the word out for, for NACSAP. Um, I think early on in the process, there were two original webinars that they now have archived up on the e-extension site. Um, you can access those. There have been other webinars that I haven't seen have been archived, but we've done some other NACSAP webinars as well that, uh, that are probably floating around out there someplace um, through, through the LPELC. Um, NRCS has also, we've got a, a science and technology training library that we have at conservationwebinars.net. And about two years ago, uh, we, we went ahead and did a series also of uh, of webinars that are housed there, so those are publicly available as well, and you've got the links to all of that here. Um, we also, uh, back about 18 months ago, back in the end of September or end of 2015, we were able to provide some funds <coughs> actually through Florida A&M University to provide training, reach a couple of regional trainings to our NRCS folks around the country, and and the funds were really. We were, we were expecting to have four different trainings around the country, and as we kind of got into things and started putting these on, we realized that we might be able to do a couple of extra, so we ended up with six total. Um, you can see where those locations were again. We, we tried to spread them out a little bit and, and get some ge good geographic coverage, um, and, and those just ended back in March, so this last month, and the project is now over as well, but we were able to go out to different states had between 17 and 43 people at each of the trainings, and 43 was probably a little bit too many at the training just to try to herd everybody off and on farms, but it was a combination of classroom as well as on farm, uh, you know, going out, talking to the producer, running through the tool with them, and getting them to answer the questions, and then just kind of seeing how it worked and, and how um, what you observed on the farm resulted in a score, and then what you could do about that. That was kind of the, the gist of the trainings there. So we've done a little bit of that. Um, Hopefully, we've, we've had some discussions with, again, with our university partners now about maybe doing some more of these, you know, kind of off the NRCS books, but pulling in NRCS people in different states to, to maybe come in and, and, and do a little bit more localized training as we keep, uh, as we keep implementing the tool as well. <coughs> so, jumping now to what are we doing in NRCS. Um, there really hasn't been a whole lot of adoption just yet. I think it's, uh, well, for anything government-wise, it, it takes a little while to get that momentum to, to get people to use things, and then Max, that's no different. Um, what we really figured out was that, um, you know, right now we don't have any other tools available uh, within NRCS that are NRCS approved that we can give to our conservation planners and tell them you can use this tool to help you figure out what's going on air quality-wise at a farm that you're working with. We, we just 
don't have anything else that, that's NRCS approved. And so if we don't have anything that's NRCS approved, when our conservation planners go out on a farm and try to figure out, hey, do I have an air quality issue here? What is it? What can I do about it? We're relying on those planners to know what's going on. And we found that a lot of the folks don't have air quality backgrounds, right? So um, you're, you're relying on somebody to have expertise where they may not have that expertise. And so having a tool like this can help guide folks a little bit better. And that's, that's really what we wanted to try to do. So back in 2015, after the, the last iteration of NAXAT was developed, uh, we, we have an NRCS official national instruction, which is kind of our, our uh, basic document that tells you here's what to do and when to use it and all that stuff. So we've got that, uh, that out there and there's the reference for it. And really what we want our, our conservation planners, so not just NRCS personnel, but also some of our, our partners, our technical service providers and others, you can go and, um, and use NAXAC to figure out whether or not you have an air quality issue on your site. And then if you, if you decide that you do, what can you do about it? NAXAC has the opportunity or has the capability to let you run a couple of different scenarios, change your answers to some questions based on the potential application of practices. And in doing that, you can figure out how your scores change and what, what might make a a good opportunity for improvement there. The other thing that happened in 2015, and, and uh, Jeff Porter and Sandy Means are going to have some presentations later today about our comprehensive nutrient management planning, we changed our policy back in 2015 as well. And, and so what happened there was we kind of went back and took a look at, at uh, the implementing regulations and the requirements that we have for CNMP and, and kind of went back to the drawing board and decided, you know what, when, when it was put together initially, we really wanted to look at, at uh, soil erosion, water quality, and air quality. And so now air quality is one of those three um, elements, the three resource concerns that are required to be reviewed under the CNMP development process. And again, you know, if you've got to review air quality, our CNMP policy doesn't say how to do that. Um, and, and again, if it doesn't say how, you're relying on planner's expertise unless you have some tool or some other guidance that that is out there, and so we're hoping that NAXAC can kind of help fill some of that void that as our, our, our plan writers and our CNMP developers go out there and try to figure out how do, I, how do I evaluate air quality, first of all, in the CNMP process, and how do I develop a plan to address it, we've got a tool that can, that can help uh, point you in that direction. So one of the other things that we did to kind of help in that guidance process is, you know, we had a score bar, right? Well, we've got a bunch of scores <coughs> that uh, may not necessarily all be equal. And so we tried to go back and take a look at, you know, given the emissions and how those relate to NRCS air quality resource concerns, looking at um, the different management categories, which ones are, are the ones that we really need to focus on? You know, which ones do we, do we want to put a little bit greater emphasis on? And those are the boxes highlighted in red. We, we decided by going on a pollutant by pollutant basis, we, we tried to figure out, you know, where are the main emissions coming from on, on sites? And, and let's focus on those management areas to, to see what we can do. Um, you, you'll notice a couple of boxes right there in orange. Um, those we kind of added in as, as optional. So if you look, it's for particulate matter or dust, and we're looking at feed and water, manure storage, and land application. And the manure storage and land application ones kind of pop in. If, you, if you're not handling dry manure, you're probably not going to be worried about dust from, from manure storage or, or land application, right? This is the situation where the reason it's, it's, it's orange is because if you've got dry manure, you're, you're, those are going to bump into a red category. Same with feed and water. If you're handling dry feed ingredients on farm, you know, that's going to bump up on the dust side as well. Um, as we, as we kind of went through there, I mean, some things kind of make sense. You know, we get scores for odor from on-farm <coughs> roads, and roads really aren't a big odor source, right? I mean, when you're talking about on-farm roads and you're talking about unpaid roads, you're really worried about dust, and so that's the only box that shows up there. Uh, same for mortalities. I mean, you're really focused on odors for mortalities. You're not necessarily worried about dust necessarily in, in a lot of cases. Um, so, so that's where some of those boxes come in. And then you've got other uh, pollutants like ammonia that are pretty leaky, and you can get ammonia from a lot of different locations on the farm. So you've got a lot of your boxes are going to be covered there um, under the high priority scorecards. So as we started implementing, um, NAXAT, and as we've done some of the trainings, we've tried to get feedback also from our folks out in the field and from producers that we've talked to and, and, and other people just to, you know, how can we do a better job of implementing the tool and, and are there changes that need to be made to the tool? And we've identified actually quite a few of those <clears throat> that I think as we, uh, again, all of these are, are 
are going to require funding of some sort, and as you know, the, the tool development process within NRCS um, is, is not necessarily an easy process. The uh, process also of getting funding to make some of these changes is not an easy process. So as funding becomes available and as we get uh, a little higher on the priority list for making some of these changes, hopefully we can implement some of those. I talked about the, the better guidance, or def well, I guess I didn't talk about that, for uh, the guidance and definitions for some of the questions. It, if you remember the management categories, feed and water is one of those. And in NRCS, we don't have a lot of people that are nutritionists uh, as conservation planners. And so as we were going through asking questions of producers, you know, we get down to the question of, do you add data agonists? And the, the, the people who were out, you know, the NRCS folks who were out asking the questions like, what the heck are beta agonists? There's no description in there. There's no, there's no definition. And so things like that that we can highlight a little bit better, maybe have a little box that hovers over it that says beta agonist is a feed additive that does blah, blah, blah. We can, we can help guide. And then as the producers come back and say, what do you mean by that question, our, our planners can also uh, do a better job of, of uh, explaining that to them. Uh, this is when I, I talked a little bit about uh, the better ability to guide our conservation planners. And so, you know, again, most of the folks that we have going out in the field aren't air quality experts, and that's okay because that's not what they were trained in. Um, but when they go out and ask air quality questions and try to receive air quality answers and try to come up with air quality solutions, we need them to to have we need to have a good tool that helps guide them in that direction. If, if they don't have that background, we need to be able to point them in the right direction. So that's really what what uh, this is is trying to do. It, it's you know, can we get to where you know if we have a white score bar? Why is it white? We have a green score bar, why is it green? And what are the questions that were specifically asked in, in going through the NACSAT tool that led to those scores? And, and, and based on that, we can kind of go back and say, okay, well, that question in particular is the one that, uh, that's really impacting your score. That's where you might you know, do some of your scenario tweaking and that sort of thing. And the other thing that NACSAT doesn't do is tell you whether or not definitively that if you have an air quality resource concern. So that's, a, that's still something that needs to, to be, that's a decision that needs to be made by the planner, taking into account a whole lot of other information. It can kind of, the score can help point you in the right direction, but just because you have a white box doesn't mean there's a problem. There may be a reason for that white box. There may be your only opportunity to change that white box is to do something that's gonna completely screw up something on the water side, like in the Chesapeake Bay area, and that's not, that's not acceptable, where you, know, you, may, you may be okay with some air emissions in, in those cases, but Help, help, help you make that decision whether or not that white box is bad. Um, the other thing is to take a look at, at some of the actions, the recommended actions that producers can take based on the answers to those questions. So if you get a, a white score bar and you go back and take a look at your question and, and there's a particular question that's, uh, that's the one driving the, the, uh, the score, you can go back and say, okay, well, if I, if I, what, what change can I make to change the answer to that question, essentially, that's, that's where that comes in. Uh, we've had some suggestions to include cost information for some of the practices. So as you recommend actions to take, um, you know, going through that process, and then uh, we've we've uh, had some requests for an overall index score. That um, you know, right now each of those score bars are independent of the others. They're they're not linked together at all. There's not an overall score for the facility. Um, so just to, just to kind of come up with an overall index score, and then also to have a downloadable or, or app version. We in a lot of cases you don't have internet access on the farm. We've, we were very fortunate when we did the on-farm trainings, or the on-farm portions of the trainings, to be able to, to have cell phones that worked, and we were able to go through and pretty much fill in, the, you know, fill in the answers, but in some cases we don't have that opportunity. So to have some way of downloading those questions without bringing a whole stack of paper out to the farm and answering them, coming back, plugging in at the office, and having it, having it fill out is, is another piece that uh, we're really hoping to do. And again, these are gonna require funding for the future. With that, I will stop and entertain any questions you may have. Very, very interesting, very cool, program. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned horses, so do you have any data or, or any feedback at this point, like how in the equine industry or where are like some of the facilities that have utilized? I haven't, I haven't heard of any of the horse folks who have actually utilized it yet. We don't keep track. That's yeah. the other thing about NACSET. It doesn't keep track of who, who's used it and who hasn't. So um, that was one of the things we wanted to really keep. You know, privacy is a big issue for, for our government system. So I don't know who's used it on the horse side. Um, I think one of the main developers is Tanya Hess. I believe she's at a Colorado State University. Um, so she got pulled in on that part. Um, but 
what we tried to do when we set up the different teams was to identify folks who wanted to participate, obviously, you got to start there, but then um, kind of break them up into species groups and they, they developed the different questions for different species, but Tanya was one of the main persons that's on the equine side. Yes, ma'am. Why did the science behind those boxes? Do you ask any some, some of the questions are a little bit more quantitative, and, and by quantitative, I, I mean more, you know, are you doing more or less than X on your site? Um, the, the, the way the, the questions were really set up, so again, we, we pulled together a big group of air quality, animal air quality experts. And so they used their knowledge of, of the latest science to, to kind of build questions that are, that are non-scientific, if you will, really, um, but that lead to a scientific answer. So there's no, no emissions quantification behind those scores, but the science behind the emissions quantifi quantification is used in the development of the questions that give you a qualitative score. So it, it was, that was adjusted. There is, a, there is an actual score behind there, um, but it, it doesn't have any relation really to an emission number. Thanks. Any last questions? Thanks, Rick. Thank